Hi, my name is Anne Puel. I'm working at Imagine Institute Necker Hospital in Paris. And today it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this pre-recorded session of oral presentation on genetics in primary immunodeficiency. So altogether, we're going to listen to seven speakers. We'll have about eight minutes to present their work. The first speaker, Yuval Eaton from US, will talk about predicting gain of function or loss of function mutations. Then, Amy Su is going to talk about the transcription factor GATA2 with the decade of GATA2 deficiency. Rajar Chigos, also from US, will present about human phenotype ontology driven with autoimmune from US, performed by Laura Vines Jimenez, any question or any comments, please join us. Meanwhile, I, I hope you will enjoy the session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Yuval Itan, and I will be talking today about estimating the functional impact of human genetic variants. I will be presenting today some work we have been doing uh, in my lab and as a postdoc at the Gazanova lab over the last uh, few years. I have nothing to disclose, no conflict of interest. So this is a very standard bind traumatic pipeline of whole genome and whole exome uh, sequencing, where we start with a uh, row reads, we do the alignment, some quality control, and then we end up with what is interesting for me, which is the annotated genetic variants in patients, where we try to estimate which of the variants and genes are disease causing. Here we see a standard uh, list of genes in a patient suffering from some genetic disease after doing a rigorous filtration. So we have here a classic um, needle in a haystack problem. Basically, which of all these genes is the one that is disease causing uh, in the patient? A standard way of doing that is to try and estimate which of all these genes is functionally, biologically closest to genes that are already known to be disease causing, like allow 3 in herpes simplex encephalitis or node 2 in Crohn's disease. To help with this task, we developed a method called the human gene connectome, where like in GPS navigation uh, between cities or between two points on a map, we navigate instead between any two given human genes in the human genome. So the way we constructed it was to generate a network from all protein-protein interactions uh, database uh, called string. Then on top of this database, we apply the shortest distance algorithm between any two given human genes. And the output is what we call the biological distance between any two given human genes of interest. So the advance of this approach is that instead of uh, describing two genes uh, as being in the same um, pathway or being directly connected to each other, now we can estimate the functional relatedness between any two given human genes, regardless if they're directly or indirectly connected to each other. And over the last uh, few years, we have made uh, some very nice discoveries, especially in, in primary immune deficiencies, where we use the core genes, genes that are known to be PID causing, and we estimate new genes by the relatedness to the known uh, PID genes. And if you don't want to use the uh, human gene connectome server or want to have a quick estimate of genes that are likely to be causing the disease you're working on, then we develop the closest disease genes uh, server, CDG. Uh, so it's a very simple to use online page where you can do it in both ways. One is to input a list of uh, candidate genes and then the output would be diseases that are likely to be correlated with these genes or diseases that are known to, to be caused by the genes. Or you can input the disease name like uh, flu, um, herpes simplex encephalitis or any other diseases. Uh, not necessarily PID, and then the output would be genes that are predicted to be correlated with the disease, 
or genes that are known to be already causing that disease. Then another method um, we previously developed is the gene damage index, which is trying to um, trying to handle a problem which is many false positive genes coming up in patients' exomes and genomes after filtration. And the reason they are often coming up is because these genes are very highly polymorphic in the general healthy population. So what we've done was to calculate the accumulated mutational damage in each protein coding human gene in the general human population in the 1000 Genomes Project uh, database. And then the genes that are considered to be having high GDI scores can be very safely removed from the analysis because we were showing that they uh, almost always not causing a severe genetic disease. So also here we have an online uh, server which is easy to use. You can choose your disease model and the mode of inheritance, uh, put a list of uh, your candidate genes, and if the damage prediction score for this gene is high, then it can be very safely removed from the analysis. And by that you can remove between 20 and 60% of false positives in a very simple way and a safe way. Another issue in the field is the damage prediction uh, score software like CAD, Polyphon, SIFT, and others, which even up to this date are uh, predicting the pathogenicity and whether the variant is benign or neutral by a fixed uh, cutoff across all human genes. So you can see in this example that if we apply, for example, in CAD, the popular cutoff of 15 for estimating whether a variant is benign or pathogenic, then if you remove anything below 15, then in the two left genes, you would have 100% false negatives. Basically, all mutations that are disease-causing in these genes are having CAD scores under 15. And vice versa, if you apply this cutoff with genes like the two ones on the right, with a very high CAD scores for their pathogenic mutations, you would a very weak power to remove uh, benign variants. So to address this problem, we developed the mutation significance cutoff, where for each human gene, we propose for uh, polyphen, SIFT, and CAD, uh, cutoffs based on the gene where the mutation is harbored. So now for the first time, you can estimate pathogenicity or whether the variant is uh, benign or neutral based on the gene. Uh, so you can see that there is a very large range of uh, proposed uh, cutoffs based on the gene. So any, it is basically showing that any single cutoff that you would apply to all human genes would be inaccurate. So we very highly recommend using um, a gene-based cutoff if you want to very safely remove uh, benign variants from the analysis and to avoid very high false negative rates. Then we realized that even after doing all the most rigorous uh, possible filtrations, we often come up, come, come up with uh, genes that have very nice p-values in case control studies. But the reason that they come up is because they are very frequent uh, in our court of patients, but they are absent in public databases. So basically they look like very good candidates because they're common in our patients and they seem to be very rare in the general human population. But in many cases, when we have such results, it is due to false positives. It is because uh, these are actually common variants that were removed for some reason from uh, public databases. So what we have done to address this problem is to develop the blacklist, basically, a list of variants that are very common in primary immune deficiencies and absent or very rare um, in public uh, databases. And what you can do is not only use our pre-calculated blacklist, but also to generate your own blacklist in your own cohorts, where we recommend to have over 500 patients to have it uh, efficient. And we can see here, firstly, that the blacklist variants are due to many different reasons. So it can be in GC regions, it can be in uh, repeats, in ALU elements, 
show content uh, repeats, but whatever the reason is, it is causing the high false positive rate. Um, and we can also see on the left that when we do case control studies where STAT1 is the disease causing uh, gene, when we remove the blacklist variant, STAT1 is actually becoming very significant, uh, and rightfully so, because this is the causative one. So it's also another approach uh, which makes it uh, very effective uh, to remove false positives. Then we developed a PopPiz, which is a user-friendly online interface uh, to look at uh, mutations in the context of the gene and in the context of uh, damage prediction scores and any specific population you're interested in to try and prioritize visually your variants of interest in the context of the gene. And also we made available Sick Tailor, which is um, making it possible to get very simply uh, genetic sequences in the in FASTQ or FASTA format, where you can do it by reading from VCF files. So it's basically getting you sequence around mutations, variants of interest, and you can also do it by extracting the corresponding protein sequence for different purposes, like um, multiple sequence alignment or for uh, splicing variant predictions or for others. Now for the ongoing project. So the first one I will talk about is to predict whether uh, a mutation is gain of function or loss of function, but based on the DNA sequence. So there is currently nothing that can do it uh, properly. This can be only done uh, in the lab experimentally. Um, uh, but what we've seen uh, is that the gain of function and loss of function uh, mutations seem to be uh, clustered on different domains of the protein. And it's very important to detect whether a mutation is gopher loss because the functional consequence in the disease is very different for gopher loss mutations in the same gene. So we can see here that damage prediction scores really cannot differentiate GOF uh, from loss mutations. So we aim to try and resolve uh, this problem. And we can see here that the only two methods we know about to try to handle it were really unsuccessful because it was trained only on two genes. And the second one does not provide any available tool and also is trained on a limited set. This problem was to firstly generate a database, the biggest we know about so far, of uh, gain of function and loss of function mutations using natural language processing, then extensive uh, annotations at the gene and protein level, and then to do feature selection to try and identify features that are separating GOF from loss mutations. So what we've done was to take the human gene mutation database in collaboration with uh, David Cooper from uh, University of Cardiff and his team. Um, we have corresponding abstracts for, our, for the pathogenic uh, mutations and genes. And by that, we are now having over 1,000 GOF and over 10,000 loss mutations. And this is just a demonstration of how it looks like. We need to be very careful of not having false negatives and false positives because the, you have many different ways to write loss of function and gain of functions, including uh, symbols and synonyms. Then after having the database, we annotate them by many different uh, gene level features using the ensemble VEF annotator and also using uh, the added value here, which usually geneticists uh, don't do, which is uh, protein level features using different uh, protein prediction uh, software. And this is the, uh, a summary of the most informative uh, features coming up in our analysis. Now I'll go more in depth. Uh, so GOF mutations here are in red and LOF are in blue. And we can see that, for example, uh, frame shift mutations are more, much more common in LOF. Uh, and we can see that uh, the impact is also different between GOF and LOF mutations. Uh, we can see here at the gene level that the essentiality of the gene is different between GOF and LOF mutations. Um, also, as we know, we can see also here computationally that uh, GOF mutations are more autosomal dominant and LOF are autosomal recessive. This is a nice uh, computational validation to this approach. 
And also a very effective um, feature is the number of paralogs of the gene. So the more copies the gene has, the more likely it is to be off, and the less it has, the more likely it is to be lost. Again, biologically it makes sense, but it's a nice um, validation to this approach. We also see a very big uh, difference in some of the amino acid substitutions that uh, are abundant, uh, some of them in LOF and some of them in GOF. So to summarize that, we can use um, feature selection using machine learning to show computationally, which are, and statistically, which are the, uh, the features that can be best used to separate GOF from loss mutations. And we can see that here, the most effective is a number of power logs, but there are many other gene level uh, and protein level that are also very highly effective. And these are only the top, uh, the top ones. So all of these are effective for the separation. And this is doing the same thing, looking for effective uh, features to separate GOF from loss, but using features exact test and we see the same ones coming up, but also additional ones that can be later used for a classifier we're now developing to computationally uh, automate this process. Now for the second ongoing project, which I will talk about only briefly, is a deep learning approach to try and identify pathogenic mutations. So like you know, many methods are trying to handle that, but trying to use the best methods in patient exomes in which the true mutation is known, it's usually it's ranked on average number 55 out of 220 filtered variants. So although statistically they work, uh, basically nobody's looking at mutation number 55, so they don't really work. So our aim is to get to the true pathogenic mutation to top five at least. And the reason these uh, methods don't work, we think is because the training is based on pulling together all pathogenic mutations versus uh, benign variants. But what we see is that mutations causing different uh, disease types are having different uh, features and they cluster differently. So what we want to do here is to make a disease aware mutation prediction deep learning uh, software. Uh, so here we see that when we, um, when we assign a disease group for each uh, HGMD mutation and try to cluster by diff three different disease groups, we see actually a very nice separation in this early work. So we're quite optimistic about this approach. And currently we're working on doing very extensive annotations uh, on many levels, basically, to be able to move on to a deep learning classifier. Well, first we will do dimensionality reduction to take only the features that are most in informative for the prediction and then to apply a uh, deep neural network, which is also called uh, deep learning, uh, to be able to separate and to predict uh, pathogenic mutations based on the disease group that they are causing. And then lastly, I'm going to show how we applied all these methods in uh, an IBD project. So although this is a uh, primary immune deficiency conference, I think the results here are actually showing that once we apply uh, these methods of a rare high impact variant in an adult complex disease, we actually get to see uh, PID signatures. So the design plan here is to firstly properly uh, select the cases and controls by phenotypes and by PCA to check the correct uh, uh, population. Uh, and then doing a gene burden, FIWAS and polygenic risk score analysis. So firstly, we wanted to identify Ashkenazi Jews in our cohort. Uh, we've done it by admixture and PCA using the Jewish reference panel. Then we also cross-validated with our Mount Sinai uh, Biome Biobank, where we identified also properly the Ashkenazi Jews. Then we showed that uh, we have enough power to do the gene burden analysis and perform the filtrations uh, using the methods I've shown you before to do select the uh, high impact variants. Uh, then after doing the gene burden analysis, we identified the uh, genes and mutations with, uh, that are genome-wide uh, significant. 
And we also wanted to show biologically, not only statistically, that these genes are relevant for IBD. So what we've done was to simulate the biological uh, distance by the human gene connectome of the candidate genes to the known IBD genes, but also comparing the distance of randomly selected human genes to non-IBD genes, showing very high statistical significance of these genes uh, being uh, biologically relevant for IBD. To even uh, filter more and to further computationally validate, we used four uh, complementary pathway uh, prediction software. And the cross of uh, these four software of our candidate genes produced um, uh, nine candidate genes. And very interestingly, some of these genes uh, are known to be related to immune system uh, deficiencies, which was not shown before. And interestingly, the genes coming up are actually shown to be closer to very early onset IBD genes than they are to adult IBD genes, showing that the genetic architecture that you're investigating uh, would also be very good to predict alternative genes compared to previous studies using uh, usual architectures for this specific disease group. And this is just a result summary showing to you uh, the different uh, genes, mutations, and pathways, starting from the pathway level to the gene level to the mutation level, and after crossing the results, uh, showing significant uh, results for the nine uh, genes that we're uh, hoping to take later to the lab to experimentally validate. But before that, we were showing that uh, also computationally by bulk RNA seq showing high. Uh, false induction by polygenic risk score showing that when we combine the common and the rare model together, we have high power to predict uh, susceptibility risk to IBD. And lastly, by using phenome wide association studies in uh, Mount Sinai's uh, biobank, we see that relevant phenotypes in red are coming up as very significant. And lastly, here we see in single cell RNA sequencing that uh, relevant um, cell types are being highly expressed in our candidate genes. The future work we're planning here is to do population-specific studies in the same way where we will look at Europeans, Hispanics, African-Americans, and Ashkenazi Jews separately, do the overlap, and look for genes and mutations that are specific for these populations, but also for the overlap of the causative genes across these populations. So there are many people and collaborators and patients uh, to thank. And I will be very happy to discuss later on by email or by talking. Thank you for listening and goodbye. Hi, my name is Amy Sue. I'm from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease at NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. And I'm going to talk today about a decade of GATA2 deficiency. The genotype and phenotype are emerging. If you have questions during this session, I urge you to use the Q&A function on the upper right-hand corner, and these will be addressed during the live Q&A section at the end of the session. I have nothing to disclose. So the disease that's come to be known as GATA2 deficiency, was first phenotypically described by our group in 2010. And these patients presented with infections, cytopenias, and non-hematologic manifestations, and a variable age of presentation. The disease gene, GATA2, was identified by our group and others in 2011. GATA2 is a hematopoietic stem cell transcription factor. Homozygous knockout mice are embryonic lethal at day 10. However, the heterozygous knockout mice are viable, but they have reduced stem cells at birth, roughly 50% of their wild-type litter mates. And GATA2 deficiency has come to be known as one of the bone marrow failure syndromes. 10 years of screening patients has provided a broader phenotype and, more importantly, clinically healthy mutation-positive relatives. Our cohort consists of probands referred to NIH either for genetic diagnostics or for clinical management. We confirmed their GATA2 mutation and then offered at-risk relatives genetic testing. Performed a chart review for hematopoietic and syndromic features. So over the past 10 years, we've collected 234 individuals, 
which has 124 probands and 110 mutation positive relatives. Our gender split is about 60-40 female to male. As I mentioned, GATA2 is an autosomal dominant disease, so every patient has a wild type allele, shown in green on the upper right. The patients were then grouped by the effect of their mutation on the, GATA2, on the mutant GATA2 protein. So the first group and the most common mutation seen are the enhancer element mutations. These are, reside within an intronic enhancer element and reduce transcription from that mutant allele. However, the protein produced by that transcript is wild type, and they still have wild type transcript from the other allele. In contrast, patients with null mutations have no transcript from the mutant allele. These are caused by premature stops, frame shifts, splice mutations occurring early enough to trigger nonsense mediated decay or full gene deletions. The last three are all protein positive mutations. Truncations are premature stop codons or late splice or frame shift mutations that affect the second zinc finger, which is the DNA binding portion of the protein. They do make stable protein, but somewhere in the middle of the zinc finger, the rest of the protein is lost. In contrast, those mutations we call second zinc finger are small missense or small insertion deletion mutations that are in frame, and the mutation affects only the second zinc finger, only the DNA binding portion of the protein. And then the last group are the C-terminal mutations. These are missense or frame shift mutations after the second zinc finger. So the DNA binding portion is, remains intact, the protein is stable, and yet uh, they have mutation. So looking at this, we could then group the patients by mutation class. Clearly all the probands were affected because they were referred to us, but we were able to then screen for mutation positive relatives and ask how many of those relatives, shown in the third column, are symptomatic. And that provides a degree, a score of penetrance, as shown in the far right column. And you can see that the enhancer mutations have significantly reduced penetrance compared to the null and truncation mutations in which roughly 80% of the individuals are, are phenotype, phenotype positive. And the second zinc finger mutations reside somewhere in the middle with roughly 50% of the patients having symptoms. Another way to look at this data is to say, what's the age at the first reported symptom based on the mutation class? Similar to the penetrance data, we see that null and truncation mutations present earlier and more completely with almost everybody having some symptom and the majority of the patients presenting within the first two decades of life. In contrast, the purple line, the enhancer mutations, have a median age of first symptom of 50, with many, many adults over age 50 still asymptomatic. And again, the missense mutation positive individuals sits between the two, the second zinc finger, with a median age of 23, but still plenty, more than 10% of individuals asymptomatic well into their fifth decade. The C-terminus mutations, you can see the black line there. They're, two, they're only 10 patients, so it's a little harder um, to interpret them. So this shows clearly that the mutation type is important for disease develop, progression and development. But what we don't know what we then asked is whether or not gender plays a role. So if we look at the same data, the age at first symptom by gender, we see here clearly that there's not much difference. Maybe males present a little bit later, but this does not reach statistical significance despite the size of our cohort. However, if we look at the first reported symptom by gender, we see there's roughly the same proportion of asymptomatic individuals, 22% in each group. Those presenting with infections, it appears that more women than men do, but this does not reach significance. If we dive further into infection presentation, however, what we see on the left in the numbers and on the right as a chart, we see that males present more often with non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections, whereas females present with other infections 
most notably genital HPV and extragenital HPV. They also present with other viral infections, including EBV, herpes, and pulmonary infections. As I mentioned, GATA2 disease is a bone marrow failure syndrome, and many patients present with myelodysplastic disease. Consistent with MDS seen in adults, most commonly seen cytogenetic abnormalities are monosomy 7 and trisomy 8. Again, these break out by gender, with males having more monosomy 7 than females, and females having a tendency to have a preponderance of trisomy 8. So in conclusion, the GATA2 mutation type influences the phenotype of the patient, with enhancer mutations having the lowest penetrance and the latest age at first symptom, whereas the null and truncation mutations are the most penetrant and have the earliest symptom onset. The presenting symptom and development of cytogenics may be gender-related. And if we think about patients, which patients are going to develop disease and what other modifier genes may be involved, Looking at mutation class and gender can drive the selection of patients chosen to screen for these modifier genes. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge Steve Holland, who takes care of all these patients at NIH and leads our research group, Dennis Hickstein, our transplanter in the NCI, Philip Johnson, my colleague at University of Maryland, and of course, our patients and their families and referring physicians. And with that, you can submit any questions. Thank you all for joining. Um, I am a clinical molecular geneticist at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And uh, today I'll be talking about uh, exome reanalysis using human human phenotype ontology and our attempts to automate such a process. And I have nothing to disclose. And first what I will do is um, I'll briefly give you an overview of exome reanalysis and then I'll walk you through our approaches. So in a typical exome analysis, we manually obtain clinical features of a patient from, or patients from electronic health records. We also obtain the genotype data, in this case the exome, from patient samples. Using these two data sets, we do a variant prioritization, and then eventually we attempt a phenotype genotype correlation in order to achieve a molecular diagnosis. Now, the diagnostic yield from such a process is approximately 30%, which means that 70% of the cases um, remains unsolved. And it has been shown several times that, only two citations are shown here, that reanalysis of exomes after a certain period of time yields new diagnosis. And why is that? And the reason being that over time, there are new gene disease associations or variant disease associations that are made. There are could be clinical updates to the patient and or the family. And there may be better bioinformatic pipelines and improvements and notations. All of these factors together leads to the identification of a new or additional diagnosis. In other words, over time, if we do reanalysis periodically, there should be an increase in the diagnostic yield. So our approach in exome reanalysis is uh, to use the human phenotype ontology terms or HPO terms. HPO terms are essentially a standardized way of uh, a standardized way of representing clinical uh, manifestations of a given patient. So what we do is we annotate patient phenotypes using HPO terms and use that data to identify patients sharing similar clinical features. So as a proof of principle, we took 137 patients with a known molecular diagnosis and we annotated them manually with 1,006 HPO terms describing their clinical features. Now then, we uh, analyzed these patients. We clustered them using an algorithm called UMAP. Now, UMAP clustering results in this distribution of patients in a two dimension. Each gray dot here is a patient, and UMAP clustering does pl pay, places these patients on these two dimensions based solely on their HPO terms, presence or absence of the HPO terms. And if we color them by the corresponding genetic diagnosis, you can see distinct clusters. And for example, the uh, connective tissue disorder patients um, forms a separate, distinct separate cluster from patients with other immunological disorders. Now, if you look closely to this in this cluster, you can see 
that there are several distinct separate clusters defined by the genetic diagnosis. For example, patients with NLRP3 or AIR uh, pathogenic variants from distinct clusters. But you can also see that there are certain variability that depends on the particular genetic diagnosis. So you can conclude from this that um, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, genetic diagnosis is a strong predictor of clinical features. Now with this insight, we um, use this uh, to uh, reanalysis, and for that, we took 789 patients without molecular diagnosis and 23 patients with molecularly diagnosed connective tissue disorders and annotated these manually with HPO terms. Now then, and we took these two groups of patients and co-clustered them using UMAP as before. And you can see here, this is the UMAP plot and each gray dot is unsolved cases. And we found that there were seven unsolved cases that co-clustered with solved patients with features of connective tissue disorders. And these patients right here, they had uh, pathogenic variants in the tgf beta pathway genes. When we looked at the exomes of these seven patients, we saw five of these seven patients had a uh, rare or a novel variant, distance variant in the tgf beta pathway genes. And these were all predicted to be damaging by in silico algorithms. And so these families, these patients were, these variants were in further studies such as uh, looking into co-segregation of the disease uh, with the other family members if such data is available. In one case, we found a deletion of SMAT3 where the exon 7 and 8 were deleted and we didn't detect by uh, exome, but we detected it by chromosomal microarray. And one other case, we are still investigating the genetic cause by different tests. The other thing we found is there was one patient with a pathogenic variant in TGF beta R2 which did not cluster with the patients with connective tissue disorder. Instead, it, uh, it forms a cluster uh, of patients who, who are enriched in atopic dermatitis, viral infections, and lymphadenopathy. Now, when we look at the clinical features of these patients, we saw several features shown here in green that could be explained by the TGF beta R2 pathogenic variant. However, there were certain other features shown here those are not typically seen in patients with connective tissue disorders, suggesting that this patient could be a potential candidate for additional diagnosis or phenotypic expansion. So the take home from here is that if there is an outlier with a pathogenic variant in a known gene, and uh, uh, then that may be, that patient may be a, a potential candidate for additional diagnosis. So you may have noticed that every time I have mentioned uh, HPO term annotation, I have used the word manual, and that is a tedious process and could be error prone. So to fully automate the exome analysis pipeline, we extracted, we sought to extract the HPO terms from electronic health records. We did so by uh, uh, using 80 patients with known diagnosis in seven genes, and we extracted the HPO terms from clinical records using off the shelf software called Neural Concept Recognizer or NCR. Now, NCR uh, is um, uh, basically what NCR does is it crawls through the electronic health records of patients and then extracts the HPO automatically from, um, uh, from the clinical records. We, to, to see whether these HPO terms were valid, we sought to use these HPO terms to pr predict the genetic diagnosis. For that, we used a random forest model and we used a training set which were randomly selected 70% of the patients and um, the test set by the rest of the patients. We repeated this 100 times to obtain accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. And we obtained the specificity, uh, uh, obtained the average accuracy of about 86 percent, which is fair, not great. And we are cautiously optimistic given the small data set of 80 patients and seven genes. Now, to show you why we're cautiously optimistic, we could visualize this data in uh, 3D. And you can see here uh, each, uh, the black, represents the training set. Anything colored is a test set. For FAS, for example, patients, uh, the training and test set cluster together, and then uh, suggesting that uh, the accuracy would be very high, but that is not the case for STAT, um, STAT1 gene, which is shown here. We are further investigating this, but it's a promising initial result. At least that's what we think. So in summary, I, will, uh, I showed you that clustering on HPO terms aid exome reanalysis, identification of candidates with additional diagnosis, and also a potentially automated approach to exome reanalysis. 
I would like to acknowledge um, the whole team at NIH who uh, had uh, helped us in, uh, in several ways, in several aspects of this project. Thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Julia Kerholz and I'm a resident in pediatrics at the Dresden University Hospital. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to present a novel primary immunodeficiency associated with the variant in a gene called SOX1. This talk is based on a collaboration between Cambridge, UCL and Dresden University. I have nothing to disclose. SOX1 is a member of the SOX protein family, suppressors of cytokine signaling. SOX proteins are negative regulators of cytokine signaling, which are characterized by the presence of an SH2 domain and a C-terminal SOX box domain. SOX1 and SOX3 are unique in the SOX family because they have an additional kinase inhibitory region, which allows binding to JAK receptors with high specificity. Thereby, SOX1 acts as a suppressor of subsequent phosphorylation and cytokine signaling via the jak stat pathway. In animal models, complete SOX1 deficiency led to early death within two to three weeks of life due to general inflammation. We want to report three individuals from two kindreds with heterozygous mutations in the kinase inhibitory region of SOX1. In these patients, we could observe a large clinical spectrum spanning from severe infections to autoinflammation and autoimmunity. A young woman from UK with a classical CVID phenotype presented with recurrent infections and hypogamma globulinemia. In the clinical course, she developed chronic ITP, autoimmune hepatitis, granulomatous uveitis, and granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease. The clinical presentation in the second family from Germany with two affected members was characterized by an hyper IgE phenotype. In early childhood, the index patient uh, had a severe pneumonia originating from a dental abscess. Later on, she had recurrent respiratory tract infections and urinary tract infections in the absence of hypogamma. She then developed chronic ITP, autoimmune hemolytic anemia and total alopecia. Her father also had severe ATP in childhood which improved in later life. Later on, he developed pronounced Hashimoto thyroiditis and uh, bronchiolitis resulting in an organizing, pneumo organizing pneumonia, which required immunosuppressive therapy. And whole exome sequencing, a truncating mutation in SOX1 was identified in these patients. The three patients have been, earlier, uh, have been reported earlier this year by Thabatiran et al. in Nature Immunology. The immunophenotyping in these patients showed a reduced class with B cells and hypogamma globulinemia just in one patient. T cellular subtyping showed normal counts and distribution, including naive T cells. The T cell function assays showed a normal proliferation to mitogens, but a reduced proliferation to specific antigens. T helper phenotyping showed a skewing towards a Th1 phenotype and reduced Th17 cells. This indicates an interferon gamma-driven inflammatory response, which fits to earlier, earlier reports about SOX1 and inflammation. To examine the SOX1 expression in our patients, we performed Western blots on T-cell blasts. The results indicated a decreased expression of SOX1 and an increased expression of phosphorylated STAT1, confirming the SOX1 deficiency. To further examine the implication of SOX1 haploid insufficiency to STAT phosphorylation, we performed Western blots to measure protein expression and phosphoflow assays to analyze phosphorylation states of STAT1 following um, stimulation with interferon gamma. This was done on PBMCs. The results were compared to healthy controls and to STAT1 gain of function patients. The Western blots showed a larger, uh, uh, longer expression of phosphorylated STAT1 compared to both healthy controls and STAT1 gain of function patients. These results were confirmed by the phosphoflow assays, where higher STAT1 phosphorylation was observed in SOX1 patients, reminiscent of STAT1 gain of function. Taken together, these results indicate a functional impairment in patients with SOX1 um, haploid insufficiency via hyperactivation of STAT1 signaling. Check inhibitors like ruxolitinib 
have been um, successfully used to control autoinflammation and STAT1 gain of function patients. As SOX1 deficiency causes hyperinflammation via deficient regulation through JAK binding, a treatment with JAK inhibitors could also potentially be of benefit in these patients. Of course, the infectious risk has to be weighed against the benefits of immunosuppression via JAK binding, uh, JAK inhibition, sorry. Um, another option may be a curative therapy by hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Although SOX1 expression in non hematopoietic tissues persists after transplantation. And of course, sorry, of course, other immunolo immunological pathways beyond JAK stat may be of importance in SOX1 regulation with respect to hyperinflammation and cell D differentiation leading to malignancies. Finally, I want to share with you my references. The first one is the report about the SOX1 knockout animal models. These two are um, reviews about SOX1 and inflammation. And the last two reports are reports of SOX1 deficient patients. The first one I already mentioned before. This one includes the here presented patients. And the second one adds two more patients from Boston with heterozygous mutations in the kinase inhibitory region of SOX1. Let me finish this talk by thanking all clinicians and researchers involved in the functional characterization of these patients. Of course, we will continue to investigate this novel primary immunodeficiency, and we would be happy to include more patients. So please contact us if you have diagnosed patients with SOX1 deficiency at your center, and if you're interested in a cooperation. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody, my name is Jessica Rojas, and today I would like to share with you our results about targeted next generation sequencing of 326 patients with primary antibody deficiencies. This work was done at the CCI in Freiburg, Germany. I have nothing to disclose. So primary antibody deficiencies comprise a heterogeneous group of disorders characterized by recurrent infections, dysfunction antibody production, and poor response to vaccines. Among them, CVID is the most common symptomatic primary antibody deficiency with a prevalence of 1 to 10,000 individuals. Currently, most of the cases of CVID occur sporadically. However, genetic advances in um, CVID have been remarkable in approaching the proportion of single gene defects, though clearly underlying the immune defect in one third or um, more patients depending on the cohort examinated. In 2020, Alpha Hassani et al. Um, analyzed three different groups of CVID patients from three different continents. And they determined that the incidence and range of genes that lead to CVID are quite variable. In addition, they estimate the percentage of that the percentage of relevant mutations variate from 31 to 54 percent depending on the cohort. So due to the diversity of phenotypes seen in CVID and the genetic heterogeneity, we aim to identify disease-relevant mutations contributing to the development of CVID and other primary antibody deficiencies. For this purpose, 326 samples were analyzed, employing haloplates and sure selected uh, enrichment. The sequencing was done with the Illumina MySeq um, a technology and the data was analyzed using our CCI genetics unit pipeline. In addition to gain a better understanding of how the unknown variants may affect the cell function, we perform in vitro assays specifically assessing the proteins of some affected genes. So we have recruited 326 samples um, from patients that were classified according to the main suspected diagnosis. Being CVID, the most frequent one, followed by primary antibody deficiency and selective IgG deficiency. The gender ratio was balanced with 53% of uh, females and 47% of males. The median age of CVID was 29 years, patient range from months to 70 years. It is important to note that not all the samples were run at, um, in the same panel. 
uh, therefore to have a better overview of our uh, results, we correlate the number of base per sequence with the total uh, variance, meaning that the bigger the number of gene sequence, the highest the total number of variants were identified. In this right panel, I'm showing you the top 50 genes um, that were sequenced the most. So, um, in this study, we have identified over 80 different relevant mutations in 69 out of the 326 patients evaluated. Overall, the genetic diagnosis could be made in around 20% of the cases, whereas 30% of them were inconclusive and 50% uh, remained undiagnosed or we didn't identify any um, variant associated with disease. The most common causative um, genetic variations were found in CTLA-4 and TASHI genes with 16 individuals each, followed by NF-kappa-B1 with 15 individuals. In addition, we were able to identify variants in genes with autosomal recessive patterns of inheritance like LRBA, ICOS, and ADA. It was um, in order to achieve this uh, rate of um, genetic diagnosis, was, it was very important to perform functional analysis in a known variant of um, patient cells who carried mutations in CTLA-4, NF-kappa B2, uh, sorry, NF-kappa B1 and LRBA A genes. So in the case of CTLA-4, we all know that mutations in this gene affect the ability of regulatory T cells to control the levels of CD80 and CD86. Therefore, we analyze the function of CTLA-4 by measuring the percentage of CD80 binding ligand uptake assay, or also known as transendocytosis. In this representative experiment, we can observe that the percentage of transendocytosis in two healthy donors reach from 50 to nearly 70%, whereas the patient cells that carried this mutation in CTLA-4, the percentage of transendocytosis was around 23%. In this case, the, due to the defective percentage of transendocytosis, we were able, uh, able to assign the molecular diagnosis. In addition, we, were, um, we could classify variants of uncertain significance as benign based on the transendocytosis result. In this case, the percentage of transendocytosis was around 67%, a percentage that was comparable to the ones observed in healthy donors. So um, in this norm, in, due to the normal transendocytosis, this patient remains undiagnosed or the, or, um, the, the molecular diagnosis was not assigned. Finally, we also evaluate the expression of LRBA in two patients that um, carry allelic mutations in these genes. Our results showed that a reduced expression of LRBA in PBNC from the patient in comparison to the healthy uh, donor after the stimulation with PHA for 72 hours. In both cases, we could assign or, um, successfully the LRBA insufficiency diagnosis to these patients. Finally, with all those results, I would like to conclude that the employing a target resequencing panel proved to be a very time and cost efficient yet reliable method for the genetic diagnosis in CVID. In case of negative screening results for panel sequencing, further workup, including whole exome sequencing, should be considered for patients with complex disease, a positive family history, or early onset of disease. Um, finally, genet our genetics and genomics unit at the Center uh, for Chronic Immunodeficiency in Freiburg has moved to whole exome sequencing in patients with suspected inher inherited errors of immunity in order to not longer be limited to a specific panel design and to discover novel genetics diseases. I would like to thank the genetics unit and the Aga Grimbache for supporting this study and you for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions. Hello, my name is Magdalena Valkiewicz and I'm a clinical molecular geneticist 
and I have the pleasure to co-lead the Centralized Sequencing Initiative at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease at the NIH. And I am thrilled today to tell you about our experience with unbiased genomic workup in patients with immune system dysfunction and what we have learned from that experience, including unexpected molecular findings, multiple diagnoses, and clinically relevant secondary findings. I have nothing to disclose. Um, a brief overview of my presentation includes two case reports, program summary, some of the ongoing studies, as well as future directions. We serve over 35 different clinical teams at NIAD, and the patients that come see us come with a very broad spectrum of clinical uh, presentations, some of which include connective tissue disorders, atopic dermatitis, autoinflammation, atypical infections, as well as lymphoproliferation and autoimmunity. The role of the Centralized Sequencing Initiative is to provide clinical interpretation of the exome, copy number variant analysis, as well as facilitate research. The first case that I would like to discuss with you today is a patient that has been followed by Dr. Kennedy Rao at the NIH Clinical Center for the last 20 years. This is a 21-year-old female who actually has a clinical and molecular diagnosis of autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, or ALPS including a pathogenic variant in FAS. And when you look at her clinical presentation, it is very typical of that disease. So when we perform whole exome sequencing on a sample from this patient, it wasn't surprising that we detected the FAS variant that has been previously seen in her. But what was surprising were two additional previously reported variants in SLC12A3. These variants have been associated with Gittelman syndrome, and one of the hallmarks of that syndrome is low magnesium. When we reviewed the clinical notes of this particular patient, we quickly, we quickly learned they, that hypomagnesemia has been observed in her since 2007. And furthermore, nephrology note from that time also showed that Gittelman syndrome was one of those diagnoses that was considered for her. We discussed this finding with the referring team, and we quickly learn that low magnesium has been observed for over the last 13 years, and it was something that just couldn't be explained with the targeted testing, which only detected um, the FAS variant. We, of course, followed up with the family and recommended that both parents be tested and additional siblings to make sure that that disease is not affecting other individuals in um, this family. The second patient that I would like to discuss with you is a family, actually, that has been followed by Dr. Gubul Uzel. And I just want to bring your attention to the left screen of, um, to the left side of the, pre of the slide. As you can see, the proband is uh, right here with three affected children. She's a middle-aged woman, um, and one of her children who was similarly affected actually passed away. Uh, when we performed whole exome sequencing, we detected a variant in CTLA-4. This was also not a new finding. We already knew about this from a targeted panel analysis. This variant was worked up at the NIH and showed to be pathogenic in this family. But what we did not know at the time of this analysis was a pathogenic variant in BRCA1. Defects in this gene are associated with um, autosomal dominant cancer predisposition syndrome, where affected, when individuals carrying this variant develop cancer in early age, including breast, ovarian, or um, uh, pancreatic cancer, or prostate cancer. Um, when you actually zoom in onto this pedigree, you quickly see that the proband's sister have died of early onset breast cancer. And of course, both of those findings have important clinical implications for this family. First of all, genetic testing for any possible bone marrow um, um, donors can be considered. Uh, should uh, bone marrow be an option for these individuals? Um, possibly bone marrow conditioning may be affected by the, um, by the variant in BRCA1. Uh, and of course, cancer screening for this family, as this individual still has two living children wh whom she could have passed this particular allele to and at a risk developing um, early onset cancer. Um, so as you can see, 
to the examples that I just shared with you, lightning does strike sometimes twice, and the findings that we have detected on exome sequencing have clinical implications for the patient's management. So just to share with you um, what we have learned from our cohort today, as of Last week, we have analyzed 1,387 cases. We were able to provide molecular diagnosis for 444 of those cases. And although some of those patients already knew their primary findings, we were able to contribute additional findings that are important for their clinical management. For 154 individuals, we reported a variant of unknown clinical significance. And for 789 of those individuals, we did not have a molecular finding. The last two groups are really interesting to us. For the variants of unknown clinical significance, this gives us an opportunity to provide to, pro, to perform some functional studies and further characterize those variants. And for the unsolved cases, this really opens an, opens an avenue for discovery of new disease gene associations. Um, and just to remind you, through the examples that I showed you, about 1.6% of our probands had also a secondary findings. And those are genes that the American College of Medical Genetics recommends to be screened for in genomic approaches as, they, as there is a treatment or an early screening for patients carrying pathogenic variants in those genes. 27 of our cases, or almost 2%, had more than one molecular diagnosis. And as the case, first case illustrated, again, that has clinical implication for those patients. And this, the, our centralized sequencing initiative has been very active in uh, research as well. Um, Dr. Otavia Del Monte will be telling you about new disease gene association where lasso function variants as such three are associated with new disorder of the immune system. We've also contributed two patients to Dr. Megan uh, Cooper's effort on characterizing the role of TLR8 in the immune system. And Dr. Aluri will be telling you more about this um, at ESID as well. Then Mary Yu from my group will be telling you about new patient and new mutation in fam 11 b And last but not least, Dr. Raj Ghosh will be telling you about our efforts to HPO-driven reanalysis of sequence data. Some of the future directions that we are interested in pursuing include switching from exome to genome sequencing. We are interested in looking at the contribution of copy number variants and structural variants to the disease of the immune system. We are also interested in looking at modifying alleles as well as common variants. And least but not last, I would like to thank patients and their families for contributing to our research, as well as everyone on this slide, as the Centralized Sequencing Initiative truly is a team effort. And I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Hello, my name is Laura Viñas and I'm going to present this oral communication named monallelic mutation in syntaxin binding protein 2 gene in a patient with two episodes of hemophagocytic syndrome acting as a dominant negative. In a healthy, well, we have nothing to disclose. So in a healthy individual, when there is an activating stimuli such as a bacteria or virus, um, the dendritic cells present the antigen to CTL cells and stimulate them to the immune cell proliferation. On the other hand, NK cells are able to identify the trigger as well by their own and also lead to the immune cell proliferation. These cells release interferon gamma leading to a macrophage activation and the production of more cytokines. These cells also have an important function which is the degranulation and the cytolysis of infected cells leading to a clearance of the stimuli, leading to a reduce of the interferon gamma production and consequently and reduce the extended macrophage activation and to the additional cytokine production. In a patient with HLH, this negative feedback is disabled, so there is no cytotoxicity, and leading to a vicious circle of the CTL cells and NK cells proliferation and a massive production of interferon gamma, excessive macrophage activation, and enormous amount of pro-inflammatory cytokines, creating the typical cytokine storm seen in HLH. HLH is considered as a threshold disease, so in familial cases, genetic causes are enough to reach the threshold and a trigger is optional. 
Secondary HLH is considered when the trigger is strong enough to cross the threshold and sometimes a genetic background can help but it is not essential. In the middle there are hypomorphic and monadic mutations in which the genetic background is not enough to cross the threshold and then the trigger or the inflammatory background is needed to reach that threshold. So in this context we are going to present a boy with unusual clinical presentation and he is a nine-month-old child born from non-consanguineous parents who was diagnosed at two months of age with cutaneous Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And then the specific treatment started and he responded uh, with a complete remission of the LCH. However, due to the fulfillment of the HLH um, diagnostic uh, criteria, he was diagnosed with HLH and then after the specific treatment, the, control, the disease was controlled. However, due to the progression of the LCH, the patient under, underwent to a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation at, six month of, at 16 months of age, losing the graftman five months later, concomitant with a reactivation of HLH plus an adenovirus infection. As you can see in the right part of the slide, the cytotoxicity reached normal levels after HLH acute phases. As you can see, the dashed lines represent the first episode of HLH, and you can see that there is low cytotoxicity during the acute phase and then increase after the treatment. And the same happened with the uh, HLH reactivation, in which is it possible to see low cytotoxicity, which increased normal levels after the, after the treatment with, with the specific treatment. When we perform the genetic analysis, we observe a monadic variant in syntaxin binding protein 2 gene, uh, specifically a change of an arginine at position 194 a cysteine with very low frequency, and the polyphen predicted this variant to be probably damaging. Just to remember, this gene encodes for a protein called MUNC182, which is essential for the fusion of the cytotoxic granules with the plasmatic membrane. Um, as monadic mutations in HLH candidate genes, as it is syntaxin binding protein 2, can confer a higher risk of suffering HLH by leading to a scenario of, uh, of lower levels of protein, and, or on the other hand, can behave as a dominant negative. We wanted to study in depth this variant. To do so, what, what, what we did first was to measure the protein expressions, expression by transfecting this mutant to post 7 cells. And we observed that this mutation showed similar expression levels to wild type protein, as you can see here in the Western plot, or also in the graph, showing that there is no um, significant differences. Next, we wanted to know the ability of the interaction with syntaxin 11, which is the main partner of syntaxin binding protein 2, and we did a coimmune precipitation assay. And we observed a band of 66 uh, kilodaltons when we rebelled the Western blot using this. Um, antibody and the syntaxin binding protein 2, either when we co transfect with the wild type or with the mutant. So, this assay confirmed the direct interaction of mutated protein syntaxin binding protein 2 with syntaxin 11. Finally, we wanted to examine whether this mutation had a functional effect on the protein. So, we adjusted the experimental conditions in order to study the functional capacity of the granulation of the RBL cell line transfected either with the mutant or with the wild type. Um, and then we measured the amount of beta aminidase release after PMA or pianomycin incubation. And what we observed was that the RBL cells transfected with the mutant had a reduced degranulation compared with the RBL cells transfected with the wild type or untransfected cells. And this also was maintained over time, as you can see here in the right graph, that we performed the experiment at two and at five hours, and the reduced, the reduced degeneration was maintained over time. To explore the effect of this mutation in the patient's NK cells in a healthy state, PBM cells were isolated from the patient also from his mother, who was a heterozygous carrier, and from a healthy donor. These PBM cells were incubated two hours with K562 cells in order to measure the upregulation of CD107A. The NK cells expressing CD107A were, the, were significantly reduced in both the patient and in the mother. Thus, the granulation of unmanipulated NK cells 
was reduced without any inflammatory episodes and in a state of a stable situation. Of note, patients' mothers' cell and K cells had a significant better capacity for degranulation than the patient, suggesting that this may have additional factors affecting the degranulation process. However, the patient, as you can see, has some ab ability to degranulate, some residual activity. And that's why it is tempting to speculate an explanation for this normalization of NK functional activity of the patient. One possibility arises from the fact that HLH development has been described as a threshold disease, as I, as I told you at the beginning of the presentation, depending on the trigger and the residual NK cytotoxicity capacity. So in a healthy individual, all the content of the cytotoxic granule are released. However, in a patient with a mutant um, as the one that we have, not all the content is released, and this NK cell um, residual degranulation, it is enough to maintain balance under metastatic conditions. However, in the case of Epstein-Barr virus infection, this uh, residual activity was not able to cope with it, and thus the patient developed HLH. As a conclusion, it is necessary to characterize each monolithic mutation at functional and molecular level due to the likely pathogenic effect. And the second conclusion is that we have set up a cellular model using RBL cells to test whether a specific syntaxin binding protein variant, such as arginine 190 histine, could present a dominant negative effect in vitro. So, thank you for your attention.